now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton, every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally. And we've got a huge Super Thursday of results today. Coming up, Qantas weathers high fuel price headwinds to deliver a robust half-year result. The CEO, Alan Joyce, is confident that consumer demand is still strong for the airline, despite the soft, broader retail market. Our interview coming right up. Two energy giants reporting pretty strong results today, helped by commodity prices. We unpack the detail and the strategies for Santos with Kevin Gallagher in Adelaide. That's the full year results. And in Sydney, live Frank Calabria on Origins. Half year coming right up. And our special interview with ETF legend and squillionaire philanthropist Graham Tuckwell. All his views on the ETF market, why it's great for the punter and why franking credits grossly distort Australia's stock market at the expense of the investor. And look, we'll also bring you the latest on Glencore's huge decision on coal and greenhouse with the Australian Resources reporter Paul Garvey. But let's go straight to those results. Strong oil prices saw Origin Energy resuming its dividend payouts as it cuts its debt burden and swings to profit in the first half. Net profit for the period was just shy of $800 million compared to a loss of over $200 million a year ago. Revenue also higher up over 2%, bolstered by oil links sales and the reduction of financing costs. Well, for more on those results, I'm pleased to welcome Origin CEO Frank Calabria, who joins me live from our Sydney CBD studio. Uh, Frank, very nice to have you there. Now, um, I would say that uh, uh, definitely you've got uh, the dividends for investors and you've got the debt down. So pl quite pleasing from an investment point of view, you'd have to say. Yes, Tiki, good to, good to speak to you today. Uh, it's uh, been a period of a few years since uh, shareholders have got the benefit of a dividend and we've introduced a modest base dividend of 10 cents a share. It comes after a period of really uh, simplifying the business, reducing debt and improving returns. So I am pleased to be able to announce that as a, as a way back to distributing cash to shareholders. Okay, now interestingly, of your two businesses, the, the gas division actually contributed more than your retail side. I, it was the first time it's happened, I think, in, in, a, in a long time. Uh, what drove that? Okay, yes, so you're absolutely right. The integrated gas business was really the driver of growth over the last uh, six months, and really we've been able to continue to reliably produce out of our gas fields um, and uh, combined with that has been obviously stronger commodity prices both the oil price in particular because that's what these sales contracts link to but also the JKM price which is really the spot LNG price has been higher so the combination of those two combined with um, improved productivity and and reliable production has meant that the the earnings of that business have grown and you're right that's um, um, it's pleasing to see that we've now got two strong cash generating businesses well, equally, on the other hand, though, I mean, retail had a, had a tougher um, half. Now, you've sort of got that result time to perfection, I would say, in, in that it comes straight after AGL's result, where the actual profit number at AGL wasn't as high as yours, and yet it got that extraordinary response from the Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, who, who um, warned uh, that uh, really you know, all these profits were being gathered gouged out of retail investors. Are you expecting the same sort of response from the Energy Minister to your result? I, I, I don't know what to think about whether the Minister will respond to our results, but I, I would have thought that he might not on the basis that our electricity business in fact contributed less this six-month period compared to the six-month prior comparable period. Mm. Um, and really, when you look at what's driving that is that we have got competition in the markets for retail and we actually have a number of price relief measures that have gone to customers uh, in the 1st of July. And in fact, we'll have more of that coming through the second half. So we are certainly seeing the benefits of competition and price relief go through and they've been drivers towards the fact that really the energy markets business only went up by a couple of percent and it was really out of the gas part of that business. So um, I'd like to think we're getting the, the balance right between you know, our shareholders and also the fact that we're, we're recognising that we're doing more for the affordability uh, for our customers as well.
Right, it's been caught. I mean, a bit like Matt Common and his CBA results, your, your uh, results here seem to be sort of politically positioned as well. Would that be a fair comment in this sort of climate at the moment? Uh, no, it's not a fair comment um, on the basis that it's a pretty competitive market out there. I mean, we're, yeah. we've got lots of, uh, lots of people out there competing uh, to win customers and retain them. Sorry, this has just come out. Oh, yeah, no, don't worry about that. Yeah, good on you. Yes. Yeah, no, that's right. Lots of customers c competing to retain them, and that's uh, one of the things that we're, that we're really focused on. So, yeah, that, mm. from my perspective... Um, I don't think I think it's a coincidence more than anything else. Going forward, though, you do mention all this government, uh, you know, noise around regulation. Uh, I mean, I guess on the retail side, it's still got to sort out its default market electricity retailing offer. I mean, are you clear on what that means to your business? Uh, no, we're not. Um, we're clearly aware that the government, uh, through the Australian Energy Regulator, in the case of Victoria, its own regulator, have been working on how they might determine what a reference price might be or a default offer. Um, it really does very much turn. Now, these, these are two regulators that, um, or bodies that have not done this before in relation mm. to retail pricing. So um, we're really uh, waiting to, to understand that more. And then, then on top of that, it's really the government's I think in the case of the federal government, it's decision around whether it's a reference price or default offer, and we've clearly been advocating that a reference price would be better so, uh, for so, the markets, and so, so have a number of other parties. So you've yeah. got that, and then hopping across to the gas business, particularly East Coast gas, we've got a whole uh, yeah. plethora of possible scenarios depending upon who gets in in May uh, to, to run the government, but the mm. big stick, obviously, uh, was not put through as a bill because of its uh, green, the green demands around coal. Could it return under Labor attached to coal? Oh, I, I'm not quite sure what Labor's intention is in relation to the so-called big stick legislation. Mm. We're well aware that the current coalition government said they'll take it to the election. Um, you've pointed out what I've read also, which is that um, the Greens and, and Labor wanted to attach a, a requirement not to build further coal. Uh, my understanding of the comments, at least I've heard from the Labor government publicly, is that they were not supportive of the legislation, but we'll wait and see. OK, well, we've, and we've got a possible NEG coming, but who knows? Uh, also on the gas front, uh, just ex exactly. So also on the gas front, we've got uh, Graham Bethune at Energy Quest. His uh, report that's come out today warning about um, the resources, the supply shortage by 2025, which could impact uh, the three LNG trains, including yours. Mm. Yeah, the report's come out. I haven't had the opportunity to read that report in detail, but it was around the uh, six trains and only four being required. I can't really comment on behalf of the other projects, but uh, I, on behalf of APLNG, which is a joint venture, I'm very confident about the resource position we've got there and our ability to continue to run two trains. Um, mm. Yeah, so we don't believe that would be applying to our, to our project. All right. So from an investment viewpoint, um, I'm just thinking that mm. if you are looking at, at buying shares in Origin, you've got a state election, yeah. you've got a federal election, you've got complete confusion over energy policy. How can you give comfort to investors that despite all that, you've got your ears pinned back and you're going to deliver either way? That's right. Well, we've always been in, in businesses that have regulatory and, and, and policy settings. And you're right, we're in a period leading up to the election, which is a short-term period. Uh, but we've been operating a business where, for the last 10 years, I don't think we've seen an enduring policy that combined both energy and emissions reduction. Mm. So our job is to navigate that. Clearly, we will advocate for policy settings we think it produces better outcomes for customers and in terms of both affordability and reliability. Uh, but that's our job to navigate that. It does make it more difficult to invest in this environment, and that's one of the things we've been um, urging governments to therefore settle on so that we can continue to introduce new supply. Um, as renewables come into the system, we're going to need to put more uh, firming, what we call firming generation, in place. Mm. And uh, those are the things that I think are important as this energy market transitions, as it is, by the way, all over the world. So uh, when you look at us as a, as a proposition, we, we certainly have a, a business. We have, we have a large customer base. We've got a diversity of generation portfolio. And we also now have a gas business that's linked to both the domestic and, and overseas markets. And so 
Uh, that's my job is to actually navigate that and, 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 and continue to work with governments and regulators to, to get good outcomes. Frank Calabria, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Tiki. OK, well, after the break, my interview with Qantas CEO Alan Joyce coming up. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back and to the Qantas results. Now, Qantas launched another share buyback today. Uh, first half profit fell 16%, just shy of $500 million on the tails of a jump in fuel costs. Revenue was up nearly 6%, with its domestic carriers all reporting record results on the revenue side. But it, it wasn't enough to offset the $416 million increase to its fuel bill. Stripping out uh, on the costs, uh, underlying profit, slipped 19% to $780 million. Despite the dip, Qantas has raised its interim dividend to 12 cents and launched another $305 million buyback. As I say, uh, that once completed, we'll see it hand back $3.6 billion to shareholders since October 2015. Well, I sat down with the Qantas CEO, Alan Joyce, at QFHQ a little earlier. Alan Joyce, great to talk to you. Now, best half yearly top line results in, what, 99 years? But uh, fuel, uh, a big focus for everyone. Well, best revenue performance yes. in 99 years, and fuel went up by 416 million. And we recovered most of it, and our profitability was down by 180 million. So it was still a really good performance with a big t a headwind hitting us. So the business is performing really well in tough circumstances. Interestingly, your outlook for the second half, you're confident that you're going to be able to recoup those higher fuel costs. We are ticky, and I think what's, what's given us confidence is the demand environment is still very strong. So we're seeing really good growth and revenue across all of our businesses. In fact, in the first half, you know, Qantas Domestic saw nearly 6% growth, Jetstar 5% growth, Qantas International over 8%. What's happening in the second half is that headwind of fuel prices is slowing down. It's still up over $200 million. Mm -hmm. But given what we're doing with the transformation of the business, the healthy demand, and uh, what the 787s coming in, and competitive capacity coming down, we're actually very confident at this stage that we can uh, recover all of that fuel cost. And that demand environment is giving us that confidence. Yeah, fascinating. You talk about this demand environment. Now, other companies, most recently Woolworths, have talked about a, a softer consumer spend. That doesn't seem to be impacting uh, the, the airlines, or at least Qantas. Yeah, and I think there may be a change in con consumer behaviour. If you actually look at a lot of the younger generations, they seem to be spending money on experiences. Maybe, Not on French champagne. And, <laughs> maybe some on our aircraft through airfares, uh, but they are spending more on experiences and travel across the spectrum, whether it's Jetstar or Qantas first class. We're certainly getting that. And they may be spending less on retail and alcohol, uh, which is certainly the case. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I will say there are weaknesses that are there, but we're able to cope with some of those weaknesses by moving supply around. For example, Darwin um, had a big drop in demand as a consequence of a couple of resource projects stopping. Now we are able to move our assets, account for that, and move our assets to places like Western Australia where there's been a big uptick in demand in the resource sector and we've actually had a 10% capacity growth in WA. So there's a lot we can do to manage the variations in demand that we're seeing there at the moment. Resources, uh, you see opportunity in the resources sector. You've taken a position actually in Alliance. I think that slightly alarmed your competitor uh, version Australia and it's something that uh, uh, the ACCC's Rod Sims uh, may well be looking at. Yeah, so th I think the ACCC have said they are looking at it and we think there's a really good case to show how this continues to be uh, very much good for competition. Even if you go to 100%? 
e even if we go to 100 percent, and we have to make that case with the ACCC, which is the policy. But at 19 percent, uh, 19.9, which is what we hold today, nothing's changed. We have no board director, we have no influence on their strategy, and uh, we think it's a good investment because of this resource sector starting to boom again. And in fact, two days ago, Alliance announced an extension of their deal to 2021 with Virgin. So that clearly shows that it's working completely independent from the Qantas Group today. But we think there's benefits for, for the consumers and customers in the long run. Yes. If we can get the scale advantage of having Alliance and our fly-in, fly-out business, one-stop shop for people like BHP and Rio yes. to be able to have the relationship with it, an entity in this in this position. So you, yeah, and we'll make that case to the ACCC. You might be messing with their heads perhaps over there at Virgin Australia. I mean, they're also concerned, aren't they, about um, this uh, proposed code sharing that you have uh, internationally with uh, an airline like uh, Cathay. Isn't this sort of tie up actually reducing competition rather than uh, increasing competition? No, completely the opposite because we're fighting competitively against Cathay on the Hong Kong market between Australia and Hong Kong. But what we're allowing is that passengers flying to Sri Lanka or to Vietnam with Cathay have a choice with the Qantas code all the way through. That's where the code share co comes in. That's competitive against other airlines like Singapore, which has the market. So it improves competition. And then similarly, Cathay have access to our domestic market to make them in fact more competitive against Qantas because they can fly with a code uh, to anywhere in the Australian market that they want to. But I think what's happening in some of these cases is unfortunately I think it's a bit of sour grapes. You know Qantas is good at relationship management, it's good at dealing with partners, it's good at keeping the relationships and when there's an opportunity like Virgin lost the Air New Zealand relationship, we were there to grab it. We've got a very competitive dynamic with Air New Zealand. Same thing, we're both coding at each other's network mm -hmm. at the end of the market. That's great for consumers and doesn't weaken competition in any way. Just looking at China traffic, now I noticed in the papers recently in New Zealand there's been a suggestion of uh, a slowdown in China tourists to New Zealand as a result of their position on Huawei. Uh, have, have you seen anything in terms of, or you worried about a, a possible boycott uh, with Chinese coming to Australia at all because of our position? No, we're not seeing anything in that space. And, you know, we've got a very good relationship uh, with China Eastern and China Southern, uh, two of the state-owned massive airlines in China. Uh, we are seeing growth from China slowing down, but I think that's a general activity that's taken place with travel and economic activity out of China. Uh, for the last few years, it's been double-digit growth by the Chinese carriers. In the forward schedule, that's coming down to around 4%, mm -hmm. still growth and still passengers coming in and in our forward bookings we're certainly not seeing any change in the, in the demand profile that we were seeing a few months ago. And Alan, what about uh, currency? What about the A dollar? I think 75 cents is your uh, sweet spot. What are we now, about 72? We are. And, you know, we can see in our numbers that the dollar has a number of impacts on us. Um, if the dollar comes down, it increases our, our costs because a lot are in US dollars. Uh, it helps us uh, with demand because people are less likely to go overseas and stay domestically and foreign travellers are more likely to come in. Um, so there are lots of moving parts on it, but we would like it to be around the, the mid-70s. Um, if it changes, we'll have to adapt to that as we have in the past, and we can do various things which we have in the past to be, to be able to cope with it. Alan, internationally, uh, obviously competition is, uh, is up, margins are tighter. You haven't been able to recoup all of your uh, fuel costs there. What gives you confidence for this side of the business? So, our, yes, our international business, still made 90 million dollars in the first half it was down 180 million but fuel on that business was up by around 220 million because of the nature of these very long-haul routes it gets a bigger impact but what we are seeing is the demand is very strong in the second half we're seeing fuel prices reduce as we said or at least not being as high as they were in the first half and we're seeing capacity from our competitors come down into negative growth uh, from April onwards and that's the first time I've been CEO for 10 years I've only seen that happen twice this year and back in 2010 and the other big change we're making is the introduction of the Dreamliners they're replacing the more expensive older 
uh, more fu fuel inefficient 747s. Mm -hmm. We have eight of them in the fleet. We have more of them coming and that's already making a big difference to the international business. Let me come to fleet renewal because obviously you're retiring uh, your 747s. That will lower your overheads uh, almost uh, Im immediately. You're also cancelling uh, part of your order for uh, more A380s. Now a question uh, sometimes asked by analysts is what uh, going forward though in terms of your overall fleet renewal is it really enough? I mean in five years time the Chapel Chapes who's sitting in, in your chair now will they be thinking oh gosh uh, I wish there'd been uh, more investment in this direction? Well I, I've been CEO uh, since I've been CEO we have over 300 aircraft in the fleet well over 160 of them have been bought while I've been CEO so more than half the entire operation. Uh, what we do uh, what we do look at is making sure that the product, the service and the aircraft are as efficient as we can make them. And we are looking at big projects like Project Sunrise to leapfrog what a lot of other airlines are doing and, and uh, buy aircraft that can change the route network. Mm -hmm. So we're not holding back on it. And you know, this year we've said we'll spend $1.6 billion mostly on new aircraft. That's uh, more than a lot of airlines are doing. So we are very conscious of renewing the fleet. We are very conscious of making sure we pace that at the right time and we think you can chew gum and walk at the same time. You can renew the fleet and you can give uh, d dividends and shareholder returns and you can invest in the product and you can pay your employees a decent amount of money. And, and we, you can and pay doing, tax. You're paying tax for the first time. <laughs> and we, well, <laughs> time. Tiki, I'd say we have been paying a lot of taxes, yes. not corporate tax because yes. of the big write-off in 13. We pay around $3 billion in taxes every year. But, but that accounts for the change in mix for your shareholders, doesn't it, in terms of the, the, the mix of the uh, buyback and the dividends? Yes, so, so I, well, t the taxes we pay are things like ticket taxes, which is a tax on revenue, which go to the government. We pay payroll tax, we pay uh, uh, PAYE, we pay a lot of taxes as part of a business. But you're right, we've allocated in these accounts 152 million a corporate tax that we will be paying. And if the business continues to produce the profits it's currently producing, uh, those tax payments will be quite considerable into the future. Right, now you're not very happy with this Productivity Commission report into the airports, which seems to suggest that uh, things are pretty all right in, in our airports. Yeah, and it doesn't pass the sniff test, Tiki. You know, you, you park at airports, a lot of your listeners, a lot of your viewers will, and they know that airport charges, parking charges are very high. The Productivity Commission says they're not. Uh, we know that doesn't pass the sniff test. And we know equivalently what we're being charged by airports here in Australia. And in a, at the end of the day, you, the consumer, are actually paying that. So where to next in this debate? So this is going to be uh, decided, I think, with the politicians. It's going to have the politicians looking at what form of regulation do we need in this space and how do we balance the rope. I kind of say all we're asking for in reality is that somebody like the ACCC it comes in as an independent arbitrator and makes a decision. In our dispute with Perth Airport, mm. uh, where we, we have a dispute, they're taking us to court, which could take up to four years. What we've said is let's not go through a four-year costly process process, let's get somebody like the ACCC in. They do this all the time. All right. Or an independent arbitrator. And, you know, I think that is fair. Okay. Right. Well, let's give them another job. Uh, now, uh, you've announced um, a reduction in your waste to a landfill of 70 5% by uh, 2021, I think. Now, apart from doing the right thing, quote unquote, is this going to uh, attract a particular type of investor, do you think? I, I think I think it's good for all of our stakeholders. You know, uh, I was talking to our employees out there who were taking us through some of the things we're doing. They're part of a green team. There's over a thousand of them working. Where they're so excited about this. And they, they get despondent when they see all the waste coming off the aircraft. I, I, I have letters from customers saying, why can't you get rid of these single-use plastics and why can't you speed this up and investors are looking at companies that have an environmental credentials and want to invest in them so it's good for all stakeholders mm -hmm. I can I say our targets are now the, the, the largest of any airline in the world you know we produce we carry fi over 50 million people a year 
but we do produce 30,000 tonnes of landfill each year. A lot of jumbos. That's 80 jumbos. <laughs> and we yeah. are retiring the jumbos. We want to retire 60 of those 80 by 2021, and we're on track, I think, to do that. Finally, Alan, uh, loyalty, also a very important part of your business, I think, uh, growing at 4%, uh, again, strongly uh, this year. Uh, I'm wondering, are we going to uh, be in a situation next year for your 100-year birthday where you're still firing on all pistons? I, well, I, I think so. And I think so because I think the business is, is, is resilient. The business is adaptable. We've changed the business models when we needed to to cope with the environment that's there. And I look at the great strategic position we're in domestically with the two brands that are working really well. I look at the great position we are with loyalty, where 36.5% of all credit card expenditure in Australia is on a Qantas earning credit care of where else would you have that strength in the world and I look at the changes we're making in international the very uh, the very uh, frontiers of aviation we're breaking mm. with the Perth London with Project Sunrise and that the future has never looked better for Qantas coming up to 100 years yes. and this carrier is looking more like an infant ready for the future of another 100 years than somebody that's reached a century. Alan Joyce great to talk as always thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Now, quite a big story. Australia's largest coal producer, Glencore, has announced it will freeze production at current levels to help address climate change concerns among investors. The resources giant based in Switzerland also says it will abandon the pursuit of large coal acquisitions in the future. In a statement, the company says, we must invest in assets that will be resilient to regulatory, physical and operational risks related to climate change to meet the growing needs of a lower carbon economy. Glencore aims to prioritise its capital investment to grow production production of commodities essential to the energy and mobility transition and to limit its coal production capacity broadly to current levels. Well, the decision comes after talk with the Climate Action 100 Plus initiative, a group of institutional investors which controls around $45 trillion worth of assets worldwide. So a worthy, not opponent, but another player for Glencore there. More on this story. The Australian's resources reporter Paul Garvey joins me live from our Perth studio. Paul, nice to see you. Now, you wrote a really interesting article, I thought, on this today. And uh, you said, well, firstly, uh, the, the obvious reason why Ivan Glassenberg, this tough guy, has done this is, is uh, really to address Glencore's reputation. Exactly. Um, Glencore in the past has been a company that's not really given uh, great weight to the, I guess, the warm and fuzzy issues of, of corporate life. Um, mm. They've made billions of dollars historically by going into the countries and the commodities that, that other companies just are too fearful to tread into. Um, so to see them turn around and embrace uh, this, um, this, 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 uh, this line about coal was, was quite startling at first until you kind of start to work through what are some of the actual economic ramifications of this for Glencore. Okay. And it, that, uh, that measure looks like they're going to handsome, uh, profit handsomely from this. Right. Well, let's drill into that um, because, uh, I mean, yes, you think of Glencore as being very male, hairy-chested, uh, aggressive, and, of course, it has all the history with Mark Rich and the, uh, all the questionable stuff. And even recently, I think it's, it's been in a bit of trouble, hasn't it? Exactly. It was just, uh, just last year it, it copped some subpoenas from the U.S. Department of Justice um, concerned about allegations of money laundering around some of its operations in Nigeria, in the DRC, in Venezuela. Um, now, perhaps in the past it might have been able to sort of shrug that sort of controversy off, but mm. um, it, took a, it, it really caused a massive hit to uh, not only Glencore's reputation, but its share price. And uh, that's obviously become such a, a, a big issue that they felt they've had to take action and, and offer up something here to perhaps appease some of those, uh, those more socially conscious investors Indeed. that are, are more Indeed. and more prominent in the market today. Indeed. So that ticks that box, which is a very important one, obviously. Now, but you're suggesting that Glencore, by doing this, is, is very masterfully doing what it does best, and that's cornering the market. Exactly. I mean, again, it was only last year they wrapped up uh, about, I think, $3 billion worth of acquisitions in the coal space, uh, mm. which have really given them the greatest suite of coal assets um, of any company anywhere in the world. So um, 
in one, you've got to also remember that the idea that they're not going to expand or acquire any more assets, well, they probably couldn't anyhow. They'd bump into all sorts of uh, regulator, regulatory issues, anti-competitive issues all around the world if they were to try to increase their position any further. So mm. um, you could really argue they're not really giving up a whole lot by doing this. And by, by pledging not to add any more production, they're, they're making sure that that supply side of the market um, can't really grow materially regardless of what happens in price. So, yeah, and it's know, very, very... And demand 101. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh, very, less, very less clever supply. because, because um, places like India and indeed China, demand is still very, very strong and going to remain strong for a long time. So that they've, got the, they, they've got the pricing sorted as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, for all the, all the conjecture about coal and the future of it and, and whether it's worthwhile being invested in, the world still needs an awful lot of it and is going to need an awful lot of it for a long time to come. Mm. Glencore is, is, is intimately aware of that better than anyone else in the world. They understand those dynamics. They know there's going to be a big market for the coal they produce for a, a long while. Um, and really by saying, well, we're not going to produce anything above what we're at right now, um, they're making sure that the, the price is going to stay strong uh, for a while to come, I would think. Very, very clever. Go back to their trading base. Paul Garvey, it was such an interesting uh, piece. Thank you very much for enlightening us. Thanks. No problem. Anytime. Cheers. All right. After the break, we'll dive deep into ETF investing with the chairman of ETF Securities, Graham Tuckwell. Next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Anyone working in the ETF sector knows about Graham Tuckwell, the Australian founder and chairman of ETF Securities, uh, which invests in exchange-traded funds, commodities and currencies. He created the first gold-linked ETF and last year sold his Euro US and Euro businesses for a lot of money and he now runs ETF Capital, the largest private equity player in ETFs, which is looking to bring some frontier thinking into the sector. Well, Graham Tuckwell is in Australia visiting ANU, the university where he and his wife have now donated, I think, 150 million or so to student scholarships and accommodation. Graham Tuckwell, so nice to have you in. Now, um, can I ask you one from the punter? For the average Australian investor, mm -hmm. why is an ETF a good way to go? It's simply a cheap and transparent way of getting exposure to the market you're interested in investing in, usually the share market. Yeah, so rather than being a stock picker yourself... That's too hard. Huh. I, I can't do that and I don't believe most people can do that. They think they can, but when they actually add up their winnings and losses, um, they'll find that it's a negative balance. So the, the ETF market has uh, been going gangbusters really all over the world. Mm. It's now, what, five trillion US dollars, yep. is it, in the, in the US? And, uh, and it's pretty big here too. It's 50 billion Australian. Is there room for more? Well, it, it is simply a method by which people are moving away from active funds mm. or by investing directly themselves to put it in a cheaper form of investment. And how much of fees have got to do with this, do you think? A lot, a lot. Mm. Uh, because, you know, often ETFs are down at, you know, 10 basis points, in other words, 0.1% per annum, whereas active managers are often 1% or 1.5% one per annum. That makes a huge difference over the life period, mm. life savings period. So when they started in the early days, mm -hmm. ETF were fa fairly limited in terms of the sorts of exposure that you could get. Yep. They've now become quite different, haven't they? Well, they've added a lot more to it. Simply put, you start for an Australian investor with an investment in the All Ordinaries Index, for example. Mm. And then you'd say, OK, well, maybe I'd like an ETF for technology companies overseas, or uh, maybe I'd like an ETF that covers Europe, or maybe I'd like an ETF that covers the US or whatever. So I think it's just one step at a time. But once again, it's the simple concept that here is what you're investing in this particular market and we're doing it in a very cheap way for you. Oh, is there room in Australia for sort of new entrants into the ETF market? Do you I think? think that's going to be tough. Uh, the economics, are, I mean, because they're so low cost, yes. the, the break even for a business like this is up at a few billion dollars. 
Mm. And uh, when I started the business in, in Europe, uh, I was able to get that sort of scale quite quickly. I don't believe it's possible for a new entrant to enter Europe, and that's a much bigger market. For a new entrant in Australia, I think it's almost impossible. And when you start a new ETF like one in robotics or cyber or whatever it is, how do you get the scale? How easy or difficult is it to it's get the scale? It's a bit of a catch-22 because often these products you need about 100 million to break even. Mm. Um, and often people don't want to put the money in until there's already 100 million there, for example. But that, that's not really what should be happening. It's simply people should be putting their money based on what's called the bid offer spread. In other words, how cheap is it to buy and, and sell out? Mm. Um, but it is difficult to get the scale. And we don't have marketing budgets to cover this because the fees are so low, right. we being the ETF industry. So, so the, the um, liquidity mm. of an ETF is, is less of an issue, as I understand it. It's more about the liquidity of the stock Stocks, stocks underlying, it. underlying it and if anything the size as you say has more possibly to do with the spread than it does the liquidity. Yeah so it's quite possible and I'll give you an example when I first started the gold product in Australia we yeah. had a few million dollars in and then suddenly we got an order for 30 million dollars. Now if that was a share yes. it would move the price quite considerably but because it's an ETF and you're based on the underlying in that case gold yes it doesn't move it at all so it's really how liquid are the underlying assets so now the question you get asked all the time that ETFs are really weapons of mass destruction and that really these are as they get larger and larger and larger we're going to get to a case you know an extreme case where these huge baskets are sitting over really small amounts of of, no, of, of companies. No they're not that's the whole point so suppose for example 10 percent of, of the market was invested via ETFs and 90 percent by active funds. Yes. Okay? Yes. So switch it to the other way around, which is really what it should be. So you think so, nine to one? Yes, I, I think ninety percent of the market should just be, you know, in ETFs, in other words, passive, not trying to outperform the market, not charging large fees. So in that case, you'd have it moving from ten to ninety percent and I say, well, nothing particularly has happened to the underlying market. You're all still invested there are in the market. Enough stock pickers, enough. Well, really you, you need some stock pickers, but you don't need as many as you've got now. And maybe those that finally are left, mm. where all the others have fallen away and can't justify their fees, will actually outperform the market. Right. Okay. So then you've got a situation though that it's all been absolutely fabulous in a rising market, which essentially we've we've had. What happens with ETFs in a falling market? Because that's when um, value investors say they come into the limelight. Oh, terrific. And, and certain investors, would say, active fund managers, would say we can outperform in a, in a rising market. Well, that hasn't happened. No. So why are you going to believe them? Yeah, why are you going to believe them on average that they're going to perform in an underperforming market? I yeah. mean, look, some do, most don't, and very few do after fees are taken into account. Graham, more broadly, you say that the Australian market is distorted at the moment. What do you mean by that? I, you know, I, I, I look at it and I open the papers and I say 43% of the market, because I'm not here that often, yeah. is five banks. I yeah. think that's a distortion in itself, yes. where a stock market can, is so heavily weighted to banks. Secondly, Even though I, they're shrinking, but still they're... Yeah, yeah. Well, they are, but I'm also opening the papers and reading this discussion about uh, dividend imputation and people getting cash refunds for uh, dividends, and, and I've never seen this sort of stuff before. Australia's one of only two countries in the world that have dividend imputation. Yes. So there's this massive incentive to invest in Australia, all very nationalistic, but it means people are not focusing on investment, investing overseas in industries that aren't particularly large in Australia, and technology is a prime example of that. Yeah. It would be nice if our largest companies were companies that are actually really adding value to the economy and, and driving forward new developments, you know, technology and other things like that. It was interesting that when I spoke to John Mullen, who chaired Telstra a year or so ago, when the first dividend payment, you know, issue rose up, he was saying, we compare ourselves to Amazon, and Amazon doesn't have to pay dividends. Correct. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, you know, what, what seems to be happening, and we've looked at this in bringing ETFs out in Australia, is there is a bias towards investing in Australian companies rather than companies that might be more productive overseas mm. because of this unusual tax structure.
Graeme, I'm just wondering what you made of uh, both the Royal Commission, Hain, and of course in this space the Productivity Commission, which wound into that, and particularly around fees. Yeah, well, we're on the same page as them, or they're on the same page as us. What <laughs> we've been trying to do is reduce fees to the investor, and particularly the small investor. I mean, one of my sons worked three different part-time jobs. He was put into three different industry super funds, small amounts. Well, guess what? Half of each of those funds has been eaten up in fees. Mm. And I think, you know, it's terrific that it's compulsory to put money into superannuation, but for small amounts of money, I believe there should be a single fund, similar to the, uh, the future fund, similar to what Norway has done, where they've preserved all their oil and gas revenues, whereby people can put it Small put their amounts, super in put there. Put into the super without yeah. the government doing anything other than investing it properly in the way the future fund has yes. at a very, very cheap price where it's not being eaten up by fees. And I think that is the biggest value added that I may come out of those I think that's coming out of those those going to be a, a way away because Peter Costello, I think, it was his idea and well, it's been knocked back by the future fund. The <laughs> other thing we could do is bring out a big ETF and everybody puts their money into it. But I, I think done through the government, that might be a better solution to it and it will save hundreds of thousands of Australians money left, right and centre. Graham, you've now uh, sold uh, your major company to, I think, three buyers. You've split it up and sold it. You've now got a private equity company because you've kept the Australian business. It's got lots of money. You're investing in ETFs, but also new uh, areas. What are they? Yeah, well, they're in areas. They're all in the e ETF ecosphere, as I call them, mm. because I believe that the ETF area is going to continue to expand quite a bit. Uh, but this one's, instead of being around operators, and we've sold to people who want to become operators, that's a scale business. But what we're trying to do is supply data mm. and analytical tools so people can actually lift the bonnet on ETFs and understand in simple forms what do they really do? So what we're trying to do is to bring products to people that will really help them and help financial advisors understand them even more. And one robotic ETF versus another robotic ETF. Well, you can put robotics on it, but yeah. it doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. They okay. can be quite different. Very briefly, your philanthropic side, which is such an important part for you and your wife, Louise. Yeah. You've just seen some of your students graduating coming through ANU now. How have they gone? Some of our first scholars, some of them done absolutely brilliantly. What I will say yeah. is that... Um, done pretty we, well in finance. Anyway. Done pretty well in <laughs> finance, but also, you know, we've just opened two brand new halls of residence, 400 beds in each. So, so there's now a lot more on-campus accommodation, which we think is a really, really exciting development. Back into Australian excellence. Graham Tuckwell, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. After the break, my interview with Santos CEO Kevin Gallagher on the company's full-year results next. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Let's go to Santos's full year results. Well, it had a rebound in energy prices, no impairment charges, so they were back in the black, reporting a record full year underlying profit of $727 million, more than double the previous year. Comes as Santos reaches its net debt reduction target of $2 billion US, more than a year ahead of plan. The company is set to pay a final dividend of 6.2 US cents a share, taking the full year to 9.7. It's also resumed half yearly dividends in the first half after swinging back to a profit roughly two years after freezing those payouts. Well, I spoke with Santos CEO Kevin Gallagher from Adelaide. Kevin Gallagher, thanks for joining us down there in Adelaide. Now, we should remember these are your full year results and it's been quite a year. Yeah, look, I mean, we're very proud um, of the results we've turned in this year, Tiki. Obviously, uh, record underlying uh, NPAT, uh, record uh, free cash flow for the organisation with just over $1 billion US dollars delivered in free cash flow, uh, record, e record EBITDA, and, and obviously very pleased that the board resolved to pay a, a strong uh, final uh, full year uh, dividend, fully frank dividend. So, yeah, we're very happy and, and uh, proud of the efforts of all the team and, and what's been another high-paced year for Santos. The, the board also resolved uh, to push off uh, various advances uh, through the year. It was <laughs> up to you to deliver and prove to shareholders that this was the right decision. What drove the turnaround mm. from your point of view? 
Well, look, it's really three years in the making. In, in, in late 16, we rolled out our transform, build and grow strategy, which was around uh, selling off non-core assets, high maintenance, low margin assets, uh, and focusing on five core long life natural gas assets. And, and we have executed that strategy. We've never, we've never wavered from it. We've not deviated, even when oil prices started to recover. And of course, we're very focused then on reducing the cost of supply. And we've said all along that we believe that unlocking more gas supply on the east coast of Australia uh, will be helped if we can reduce the cost of supply. And over that period, we've reduced the onshore drilling costs in Queensland by over 84%. We've more than halved the cost of onshore drilling uh, in the Cooper Basin. And what you've seen now is we're driving production growth in, bo in both those areas because we're able to drill more wells uh, for less money. OK, and also, having been hit so hard uh, by the oil price uh, a year or so ago, uh, it's mm. now uh, going your way. It's obviously, you're obviously uh, very much a sort of oil-driven stock. What do you see the outlook for oil, oil prices going forward? Well, look, I think two things. One, one I think we, we, when it comes to oil price, I would never try and predict what that is going, going to be, Tiki. And I think ultimately we're probably still going to see a lot of volatility uh, in, in the years ahead. Um, and so a key part of our, our strategy has been to, to provide a more balanced portfolio. And that required us to strengthen the balance sheet. And we're very focused over the last couple of years on gener generating cash flow out of our assets, paying down our debt, strengthening the balance sheet, but then creating the balance sheet so that we can work the balance sheet to yeah. deliver more value for our shareholders. And you saw us able to do that by reaching our debt reduction target more than a year earlier last year, which positioned us to do the quadrant energy uh, yeah. acquisition. And what that gave for us was a much higher percentage of stable revenue with CPI linked domestic gas project, uh, sorry, contracts on the West Coast to balance out that, that exposure to oil price. Okay. And so now we've got a much more balanced portfolio, which makes us much more robust through the cycle. Right. So uh, one of the things, of course, your debt's gone up again with uh, with the acquisition of Quadrant. Uh, but I suppose one of the things that, yeah. that made the market wobble a little bit this morning was uh, your your outlook, your guidance on costs is not a, not as good as one or two uh, expected. And your yeah. uh, decision on Bonaparte up in the north there is uh, slightly slipped into next year. Is that right? Is there any would there be any be other reasons why investors should um, should just uh, think about things? Well, look, I, I think initially this morning, uh, one or two uh, analysts probably thought the capex was a little higher than what they were forecasting. Yep. And that's really a consequence of our, the, the, the high cost drilling program as we go and appraise the uh, very exciting Dorado prospect on, on, on the West Coast. In reality, our high equity positions in these assets mean we're carrying a lot of the, the capex exposure this year. However, uh, we've always said that there's a lot of interest in, in, in farming into these assets from uh, other companies uh, across the sector. In fact, I've got a, a list of companies probably the length of my arm uh, <laughs> uh, already who have expressed an interest. And so we, we, we'll evaluate that as we go forward. It will be our intent at some stage to farm down in our West Australian assets because our equity position is very high, particularly for the assets that we'd be looking to, to, to construct new developments on, such as Dorado. Yeah. Um, but that'll be something that'll evolve throughout the year. Obviously, sitting there, and I know we've got a New South Wales election around the corner, sitting there to be developed is Narrabri, which is uh, f fraught with yeah. um, uh, difficulty given the grassroots campaign that's there. Equally, you were asked on the call about the possibility of manufacturing, setting up new operations, so mm -hmm. not just sort of um, important companies like Quenos or those sorts of companies, but really mm -hmm. possibly new manufacturing plants. Um, would that depend on trying to get some movement at, at Narrabri? And can you play off the new jobs that you create with the need to release Narrabri? Well, look, Tiki, we've been saying for some time that the, uh, the, the, when manufacturers are looking at the cost of supply, they've got to look at the full uh, uh, value chain, the full cost chain, if you like, uh, that make up that cost of supply. And a significant portion of cost is in transportation. In some cases, we are transporting gas not only hundreds of kilometres, but thousands of kilometres. And, and there's a cost associated with that, and it can be up to $2 uh, 
uh, per gigajoule in terms of cost for some of those manufacturers. Mm. So we've been saying for a while, whether it's Western Australia, whether it's Darwin, Gladstone or the Narrabri region, that um, you know, we're keen to talk to manufacturers who might want to move closer to the course of supply. And that allows us to then deliver gas at a much lower cost. But, but uh, may maybe you'll wait till in after the... the case the of yeah, 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 you'll maybe wait till after the election so. for that one. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of interest, though, yeah. from manufacturers and from potential buyers uh, talking to us about locating, relocating uh, some of their businesses. And some of okay. those are for the Narrabri region. And, and so, yeah... Um, you know, we'll develop more on that story uh, over time. Uh, uh, but but all, obviously, it's all subject to, to us getting our approvals for the project. Yeah, I look forward to following that one. Now, um, obviously, uh, we know your views on uh, LNG imports, and that involves carting LNG miles and miles and miles. <laughs> um, but equally, uh, looking at other political risks, uh, there's a you know, distinct likelihood mm. that Labour will be uh, in government in May. Uh, what do you think that... Um, bodes for the East Coast gas scenario and domestic reserves and how will that impact Santos? Yeah, well, look, I mean, um, we, we, we work with both sides of politics and whoever the government of the day is, we obviously will work uh, with, with, with the government. I think what, what we would want to see, though, is bipartisan support for an energy policy and provide a stable platform and investment environment for the next decade at least uh, for, uh, for Australia mm. so that we can get certainty about energy policy, about energy mix for, for the future. And what we've always said is that we believe that as the role of gas is better understood in the climate change debate, we will see more demand for Australia's gas resources. We are seeing uh, uh, right across Asia the demand for gas grow faster than any other energy uh, source because uh, as the, uh, the IPCC has stated, mm. on average it's 50% cleaner than coal. And so okay. even in China, where the, the blue sky defence policy has directed 40 cities, the Chinese government have directed 40 cities yeah. to replace coal with gas for power generation over the next two to three years, we're seeing that drive a huge demand. And we think Australia is the best place to provide that gas from because if it's not Australia, it'll be Russia, it'll be North America or the Middle East is supplying the gas. Right. There will be no other source of energy. It will be gas. Right. And we believe that Australia works to the highest environmental standards yes. and regulatory standards. La Right, well, we cut short there, but uh, Kevin Gallagher's full interview at 10. That's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, Star Entertainment CEO Matt Beckier. Until then, thanks for your company. <laughs>